Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. So far our text. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, as I already asked in the children's message, what are you afraid of? We have to kind of poke around that a little bit. Um, is it, in fact, lightning? I'm not going to play the thunder again for you, don't worry. Is it something that's going to happen to your kids? I think after you're a parent, almost all your fears shift to your kids. You care less about yourself. Well, I, and <laughs> if you've been alive this past year, you've been nursing a roller coaster of fears of COVID, haven't you? Just the up and down and the news and who to believe. It's been hard. Finally, I think our text takes us to waves and storms and nature. But I think any of those fears work. And I want to go forward under the theme, get in the boat with Jesus. The storm is scary, but even the wind and waves obey. That picture is from the 17th century. There are about there's a flurry over, over the 17th century. There's about 10 different, really well done pictures of this account from Mark 4. And it kind of gives you a good idea of just how perilous it was. This was not a nice boat. This is way too many people in a boat going across a lake. And while the Sea of Galilee is known for its squalls, this was worse. This was a furious squall. These were experienced seamen, they, they, they knew what they were doing. There's obviously something going on here. Well, let's look at verses 35 and 36. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There is a lot of details here. We're going to unpack our text and then spend some more time on faith. The first two words are important. That day, what had just happened that day? Well, if you go back one chapter in Mark, you have about five different parables, including the one of the mustard seed that was our gospel lesson for last week. And so at the end of that day of teaching, and we, we kind of wonder, was Jesus in the boat the whole time? Because that's the next little tidbit of information. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him just as he was in the boat. This is not the first time that Jesus went into a boat to preach. But that's what was apparently happening here. And he doesn't even go into shore. He's just like, guys, let's go. We're going to turn the boat and go across the lake. Because that was about the only way he, he could get away from the crowds. And it sounds like they were other groupie boats around him too, just kind of hanging around. It's an interesting picture. Well, so they go out to sea in verses 37 and 38. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, I want to spend just a moment asking the question, why? Not so much here, because it doesn't really bother any of you, but so often when there's a fear in your life or some event that has happened that goes along with that fear, that's the question I get. Why, Lord, did this happen? And the answer is, I don't know. The answer that I have to say is because my God allowed it to happen. His protecting hand does protect you from anything that he doesn't want to come into your life. But for whatever reason, he allowed that to come into your life. 
And if there's something that is terrible or some heartache that goes along with it, the other pair of that answer is that you live in a fallen world. It's a veil of tears. Nothing works, especially creation. The weather's terrible and sometimes deadly. That's a reality of our life. And that's a hard question for some people to, to get when they ask the question, why? The final answer to that question was found in our second lesson from the book of Job. God says, I'm God, you're not. Trust me. So, let's go on. I, I, I've talked a lot about naps and I, I, didn't, I should have gotten the t-shirt that says, Jesus took naps, so should you, or something like that. Yeah, this is, I think, the only portion in Scripture we find that Jesus slept. He probably slept every night, obviously, but he's taking a nap here. And so, if you're ever tired, there's nothing wrong with you. Number two, Jesus got tired. He was human in every way. And this is important. Every time you come across it in the Gospel lessons, we need to highlight it with a marker. Jesus is human, just like me. And this is twofold importance. Number one, he really did die on the cross. God died. And because he did, I'm forgiven. He lived in my place and was perfect because I can't be. And number two, he knows what it's like to get a headache because he didn't eat lunch on time and the rest of his afternoon is bad. He gets it. So when you go to him, he's been there. You do not have a God who can't sympathize with your weakness. The author to the Hebrews talks about. He knows what it's like to be in your shoes. So talk to him. Go to him in prayer. All right. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the accusation here. This is verse 38 one more time. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Yikes, that's a little harsh, isn't it? Although, you've got to give the disciples a little slack. They were scared. You talked about fear already a little bit. And it probably looked that way. It didn't look good. That picture of the boat getting thrown around is, is accurate. It's just falling all over the place. So let's go a little bit deeper down that fear rabbit hole. The last time that I was actually scared was about two months ago. That was when my dog was throwing up blood for six hours. My daughter was terrified. And so as soon as it, you know, if you're a parent, if it touches your kid, it touches you. And while I'm not a huge dog lover, I understand that this is a part of my family. And it was kind of scary because it's beyond my control. The consequences could be bad, obviously, if my dog dies. A quick trip to the vet, of course, explained that he was not going to die. He just had swallowed two handfuls of at a playground fed by small children, which he promptly vomited back up, and he had scrapes all over his, his throat. So that's good. He, he, the dog's fine. But that's just my life. And right now, things are pretty easy. Jenna went to a funeral last week. One of the parents at her school, there's about uh, 700 families at this school. One of them lost the dad to COVID. He had little kids at the school. That's why Jenna went, kind of as a representative of the school. And that's harsh. And that's got to be scary for that family to lose someone like that. And I don't bring up COVID just because it's this specter that won't go away. I know that's for so many of the cases, but you do still hear it once in a while. What I'm talking about is that fear. And how do you deal with it? Well, get in the boat with Jesus. That's the first thing. Go to your God. That's where, that is where you take your fear. That's the only thing you can do with it. The storm is scary, but even the wind and the waves obey our God. Let's keep going here. The verse 39. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. And it was completely calm. Now, I have to tell you, this is not the first time that somebody with authority tried to rebuke the waves. Um, 
if you have been joining us for our Wednesday morning Bible study with Esther, you've met King Xerxes. And the same King Xerxes from the book of Esther is the one who went to the hell spot, the piece of water in between Greece and modern-day Turkey. And um, the hell spot had a nasty habit of some storms, and it broke apart two pontoon bridges. And so Xerxes, in a rage, ordered that the water have chains and fetters thrown into it, that it be whipped, and that it be burned with hot iron. Now, some of you are looking at me like that's crazy, and it is, because what do you think the water did in response? Nothing. (laughs) But that's the kind of guy that Esther had to deal with as she was going through, as you read the, the book of Esther. Well, anyway, Jesus is a little bit different than Xerxes. Xerxes just thought he was God. Jesus is. When our God says, be calm... The water obeyed, and so did the wind. He has complete control because the words of the Creator have the power to accomplish what they say. Your God is awesome. And it is frankly fun to watch Him control everything and then know that He controls all of those things for your good. That is His promise. Let's keep going. This is verse 40 and 41. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. I want you to pay close attention to these words. Jesus is asking, The water is calm and still like that dock. And he says, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? This is after the fact. Okay, so you're afraid. And it's gone. So whatever it was that was making you afraid, are you still afraid? So when I was, I've been seasick once in my life. There was eight to ten foot swells. I went deep sea fishing in Florida. And I was puking into a little boat with a small child. That was rough. I didn't understand what eight to ten foot swells meant. That means the boat goes up and down eight to ten feet every few seconds, and I was puking my guts out. It was terrible. But as soon as I walked back on land, it was over. I mean, immediately, and I was hungry. It was great. Now, when one of my five children hears the thunder from the children's message and comes running into my bedroom, terrified, I'm holding them. They're safe, but they're still terrified. You've got to give them a hot minute to just kind of calm down because we get wound up. Next question you want to say is, disciples, you just saw this. Why are you still afraid? Well, because they're just like us. They're still afraid. And then you have Jesus' rebuke. Do you still have no faith? Now, we need to spend some time on that line. Do you still have no faith? That is a rebuke. He's telling the disciples, what you're doing is bad here. You guys need need, need to trust me. But what exactly are you going to do with this? And first, any conversation of faith, you have to go forward under the understanding. Faith is only as strong as the object that you're you're trusting in. If I had a chair in here, and I jumped on the chair and I sat down, I have faith that it's going to hold me up, right? That's how everything is in life. Or I grew up up north, if you're going across ice, do you go across ice on your hands and knees? And as you're halfway across, you see the um, big, big monster truck roll past you because the ice is a foot thick. And then you realize, oh, well, that was kind of dumb. And you get up and you start walking across the ice. Yeah. That's how it, is with the, how it is with your God. You can be in a monster truck going through life trusting in God's promise. Do that. But I know that there are some people, some Christians, who will share glory with me, who will go through life on their hands and knees crawling around in terror because they don't trust all of those extra promises. So let's break it down a little bit. <clears throat> I think what you have to do is you have to see what can God do. Let's give you some examples. Can God fix your marriage if there's something wrong with it? Sure. Can God cure 
Any disease, back pain, chronic pain, COVID, you name it. Yes. Can God bring someone into your life that you could love for the rest of your days? Yes. Has he promised to do all of those things for you? No. That's hard. And at this point, the sermon could shift into cross-bearing, and we could go a different direction. But I want to stay on that topic of faith. How can this be abused? This is butchered, my friends, in Christian churches all around this city. And I talk to Christians who are confused and hurt. Joe or Jane Pastor stands in front of their congregation and they said, if you are afraid, you obviously don't have faith in Jesus. Because that's what Jesus says here. Why are you so afraid? You still have no faith. That is not what Jesus is saying. And yet there are people who have just been told, not only don't worry, they've been told don't be afraid. That is a confusion of law and gospel. If I go up to someone who is terrified and I say, don't worry about it, I have just, I think that I'm helping gospel, but I've just added another law on top of it. This, another person told me that I can't be afraid anymore. That's terrible. You cure that by pointing them back to Jesus. Get in the boat with Jesus. Even the wind and waves obey him and so does disease and sickness. And whatever other problem you have, go to him. That's what you do. It gets worse. Jack and Jill pastor. Keep on butchering this. They say, well, if you really believe, God will answer your prayer and he will hear you. Those disciples didn't really believe. So you're sick and you have cancer. They say, name it and claim it. They say, I want you to say, cancer be gone and then trust that God will accomplish that. That is despicable. What if your God is using that cancer to call you home to glory? And all they're doing as they're laying on their deathbed is wondering if they really believed enough. As if faith is some lather that you put on like a soap in a shower. That's terrible. What is Jesus saying with these words? Why are you so afraid you still have no faith? Let me tell you what Jesus is not saying. He is not questioning their faith in him as Savior. They got in the boat. They left everything. They wanted to become fishers of men. That's what happened. They did that because they knew all the Old Testament promises and that Jesus fulfilled them. They trusted in Jesus as their Savior. What they didn't trust was that he could save them from the storm. And he said, guys, I told you you'd be fishers of men. How are you going to accomplish that at the bottom of, of the Sea of Galilee? Why do you have no faith that I can accomplish that? We're talking about providence protection. We're talking about God providing everything for their lives. Those are, it's those little promises. The big promise Christians have by the power of the Spirit that God will see you all the way to heaven, that your sins are forgiven, that he hears your prayers. That's the faith that the vast majority of Christians share. By definition, if you're a Christian, you believe this. It's the little things that attack your faith that he's talking about right here. That's what your God is talking about. And that's what's so important. So, if you are afraid, where do you go? How do you get more faith? Paul writes in Romans, faith comes from hearing the message. Go into the word. See what your God says. Hear those promises again. And the Spirit convinces you that your God loves you. And that you're forgiven. This is all good. That's who your God is. Faith is the outstretched hand that receives the promises of God that's dropped in there. That's who you are. On Luther's deathbed, do you remember what he said? We are all beggars. 
And that is an awesome place to be at the complete and utter mercy of your wonderful, loving God. Because where else can you turn in death? Nowhere. And yet you can go across that threshold like a monster truck, cruising over it. Your God loves you. Never doubt that. You're forgiven, even in your weakness. You're forgiven. How great is the love of our God. So, are there dark clouds on your horizon? What are you afraid of? If something is really bothering you, talk to one of your other Christians that loves you and supports you. Or talk to me. We build each other up. We double joys and we have sorrows. That's how we support each other. And may your faith never be shaken. Because you can get in the boat with Jesus. The waves are scary. I get it. But all of them obey Jesus. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.